Today's case, ladies and gentlemen, is the murder of Gregory Vilma. It's a horrendous case that remains unsolved to this day. Before we begin, I wanna say a very, very big thank you to all of you that have been watching these cases on YouTube specifically. It's been really nice being able to put these cases on YouTube. And so thank you to everyone who's watched, who's commented over on YouTube, who's liked, who's subscribed, and who have joined us for these live streams as well. If you're here from YouTube, a big kiss, a big bisou, which means kiss in French, from me to all of you. We have some exciting, some bigger projects coming out on YouTube very soon, and so make sure to subscribe if you haven't and click the, the bell button to get notifications because you don't want to miss these uh, bigger projects which I shot recently overseas and which will be landing very soon. But until then, we'll dive on into this case. So this case is one that took place, as with many of the cases we've covered here, decades ago. I'm going to introduce you to the Ville Main family. So the Vilma family consisted of Jean-Marie, 26 years old. He is the father, the patriarch of the family. Christine Vilma was the 24-year-old mother. Today's case takes place in 1984. And Jean-Marie and Christine, they had been married since 1979. So by the point that this case takes place, these two had been married five years. Proxy says it's a sad case. It's absolutely a very sad case. Like I said, it's a very heavy case. And so... Feel free to take whatever moments you may need. But obviously the subject of this case is Grégory Villemain, the child of Jean-Marie and Christine. And he was four years old at the time of his murder. A heartbreaking, a horrible age, considering what transpired. At the time of this case, the Villemains, they had recently moved into their new family home. But soon after moving into their new home, Jean-Marie, he began receiving anonymous and threatening phone calls for years before this murder took place. Years before this fateful day in 1984, Jean-Marie had been the recipient of many anonymous and threatening phone calls. They often noted that the caller or callers, and the caller by the way, and the callers have famously since been known as the crow, le corbeau, the callers would reference intimate details about their lives that only family would know. Passion Bun says creepy as fuck. Definitely very creepy. The fact that they lasted years before this happened is, is scary. This caller or callers known as the crow, le corbeau, the crow would also mention other family members knowing secrets or being responsible for certain events, dividing the family and creating a sense of paranoia. The name The Crow, Le Corbeau, comes from a famous French film. The calls from Le Corbeau to uh, Jean-Marie and Christine, well, specifically Jean-Marie, these were threats that were very violent. You know, these were threats that included potentially burning down their house, killing a member of the family, sexual assault, all kinds of horrible stuff. Remember, these calls took place years before the events that will soon transpire in 1984. After moving into their new home in 1984, Jean-Marie, he was promoted at a factory after refusing to join the union. And so Jean-Marie, obviously, he had an opportunity to join the union at the factory. He refused to, and so leadership at the factory promoted him. Many people, understandably, in the union were unhappy about this. By some reports, envious, including members of Jean-Marie's own family, many of whom lived nearby. Jean-Marie's parents, Albert and Monique Villemain also received threatening letters and phone calls the years before 1984. So it's very interesting that Jean-Marie and his parents, not just Jean-Marie, but his parents as well, were the recipient of these phone calls. The Villemains actually, and their extended family, having received these phone calls between 1981 and 1984, they began to record the phone calls which have since been used in ongoing slash reopened investigations. Prior to the events that take place in 1984, the family had not heard from Le Corbeau, the crow, in over a year. Le Corbeau, in fact, actually sent a final letter stating that they would no longer be contacting the family. It is also worth noting that sometime prior to this, the Villemains even had a window smashed at their home and the tires of their car slashed. That's all what transpired prior to that day in 1984. And now let's look at the day of the crime. October 16th, 1984, to be specific, or as the French would say, October says 1984. They won't say 1984, but yes. Uh, according to Christine Villemain, on that day, she left work and picked up her son, Gregory, from the nanny around 5 p.m. She lets uh, her son, Gregory, play outside for a little while while she irons her clothes. Gregory? was playing in the garden of his family home when at 5.30 p. 
p.m. he disappears in the garden of the family home. His mother, Christine, reported her son missing, obviously as one would, and searched with police around their village. During this time, the child's uncle, Michel Villemain, receives a phone call. The caller reportedly said, I've kidnapped the boy. I've strangled him and I've thrown him in the river Vologne. I have my revenge. Chat reaction, that's absolutely correct. Horrifying, very ominous thing to obviously hear. Michel obviously immediately phoned Christine and Jean-Marie to tell them what the caller had said. So obviously, with this new information, around 9.30 p.m. on the same day, only hours after he was reported missing, Jean-Marie, Christine, the police, they go to the river Vologne, la rivière Vologne, as they would say. The French in my head is like making me say rivière in my head, so I'm gonna start saying rivière. They, they go look in the rivière Vologne. Tragically, they find the body of four-year-old Gregory Villemain, just as the caller had alleged. Now, when Gregory was found, tragically, you know, he was obviously indeed dead, and his death was caused by asphyxiation by drowning. This was only four miles away from where he was taken. When he was found, a wool hat was covering his face and his hands and feet were bound. The next day, Jean-Marie, the father, receives a letter that had been postmarked the day before, only a few hours before Grégory had been taken and from their same village. The letter reads, I hope you die of grief, boss. Your money won't bring back your son. Here's my revenge. You bastard. I got chills actually reading that. The caller was obviously presumed to be the author of the threatening letters and was the leading suspect. However, the police struggled to identify who the caller or writer was. KT Swizzle, as a good point, informing the family where to find the body is weird if you don't want to be caught, no? Well, I think in, if we're gonna profile this killer, you know, this killer clearly wanted the child to be found with these letters, right? In the letter, the last letter that it was sent says, I hope you die of grief, boss. Here's my revenge, you bastard. So clearly the motivation for the killer wasn't to just get away with this. The killer wanted them to find the body and wanted Jean-Marie to be, you know, wrought with this heartbreak, with this tragedy. But now let's dive into the suspects and the leads. And trust me, there are many. Authorities suspected, understandably, whoever called Gregory's uncle, Michel, and wrote the final letter to his father is likely the killer. I like that this is, you know, that the police have to make that clear that, you know, the guy that that's told you where to find the baby is most likely the killer, like. But, however, figuring out the identity or identities of who was a part of the various actions has proved difficult. Authorities have also stated they believe that more than one person likely worked together to kidnap and kill Gregory. The 2017 prosecutor, decades after this case takes place, the prosecutor stated the investigations and analyses show that several people cooperated together in the commission of this crime. From the very beginning, police and Jean-Marie did suspect that the killer was a member of the family. So the first suspect that I'm gonna introduce you to is Bernard Laroche, who is Jean-Marie's cousin, was investigated as a suspect early on. You see, Muriel Boll, Laroche's sister-in-law, a 15-year-old, had accused Bernard of killing Gregory. Initially, Laroche had cited seeing Boll at his aunt's house as his alibi, but their stories conflicted. Again, let me jot her name down here too. So Boll is the 15-year-old sister-in-law. So I'm, I'm, even I'm getting a little confused. Let me just check this out. So Bernard Laroche is the suspect because his 15-year-old sister-in-law, Boll, well, Muriel Boll, uh, accuses him of killing Gregory. La Roche says he saw Boll at his aunt's house as his alibi, but their stories conflicted. Boll later stated that she was with La Roche when they picked up Gregory from his home and headed toward the river. She stated that once they arrived, La Roche went off with him and came back alone. However, only two days later, Boll recanted her claim and stated she only provided a statement of, to the police out of police coercion and fear. The implication here is that in Bull's first statement, she's saying that Bernard and her picked up Gregory, but that La Roche is the one that committed the murder. However, two days later, she's the one that takes back this claim. That said, on November 5th, 1984, Bernard La Roche is arrested on suspicion of killing Gregory before being released on February 4th, 1985. He was released 
after all the claims originally made by Muriel Boyle were tossed out, either due to them not being able to prove her knowledge of what she had previously said, or even due to, a, you know, annoyingly, a procedural error on the behalf of the judge overseeing the case, Jean-Michel Lambert, Lambert. Frustrating indeed. We don't know uh, if indeed La Roche committed this murder and he may have just gotten out of jail because of either a procedural error or because Muriel Bold's statement doesn't hold up. However, there is another twist that takes place in this case because we will never hear out of La Roche's mouth what may have actually happened if he had been involved. Because you see, after he's released on February 4th, 1985, on March 29th, 1985, Jean-Marie shoots and kills Bernard Laroche before the investigation against him could conclude. Jean-Marie, Gregory's father, kills the man accused of killing his son. Obviously, uh, the, the chat's reaction, you guys are shocked. Mika Block, yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a messy case. I've got more to throw at you. But what's interesting is that, we you know, we still don't know necessarily that Laroche is the one who killed it. So Jean-Marie could very well have killed an innocent man. That said, let's move on to another suspect. And that suspect is Christine Villemain. Gregory's own mother. After La Roche was released and then killed by Jean-Marie, a case was being built against Christine. This was based on allegations that others had seen her at the post office on the day the final letter from Le Corbeau, the crow, was mailed out. Christine claimed that this was not true and that she had gone to the post office the day before. Furthermore, handwriting experts have stated that they were 80% sure that she was the author of the letter. This case is a roller coaster, Yoda Wana says, absolutely. So experts, handwriting experts say that there's an 80% chance that she was the author of the letter from Le Corbeau. I mean, whoever did this is an absolute monster. I mean, it's a four-year-old child, but obviously, yes, if it's a mother doing it to their own child, that's just another level of, it's all terrible all around. Handwriting experts also, it's worth noting, had previously found similarities in Bernard La Roche's handwriting but this evidence was inadmissible due to those same procedural errors that most likely let him out of prison early, where he was then shortly after killed by Jean-Marie. Furthermore, more evidence was piling up against Christine Villemain because a rope similar to what was used to bound Gregory was found in the basement of their home. Christine was actually arrested and charged but only spent 11 days in jail during July 1985 while she awaited trial. Villemain was actually pregnant with her second child at the time and she was released after an 11 day hunger strike. This case definitely uh, <laughs> has all kinds of layers. So the mother is arrested and she is released after 11 days because she goes on hunger strike while pregnant with their second child. Nopi asks, was she acquitted? Well, to your question there, eventually the charges against Christine Villemain are finally and fully dismissed on February 3rd, 1993. So, uh, you know, a significant amount of time later, the charges against her are dropped. And furthermore, in 2004, the state of France awarded Christine and her husband 70,000 euros for egregious miscarriage of justice. But I've got more suspects, more leads to share with all of you. We have up here, Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob. Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob, Gregory's great aunt and great uncle, so Jean-Marie's aunt and uncle, they were arrested, you know when? June of 2017, decades after the murder takes place. And just a few years ago, we are closer to when they were arrested than when the murder actually took place. They are arrested in June of 2017. They were being formally investigated for kidnapping and confinement followed by death. More modern handwriting analysis supposedly pointed to two possible authors, likely a man and a woman. The final suspect, official suspect, was Muriel Boll who was La Roche's sister-in-law who originally accused him. And she was arrested as well in 2017. Muriel Boll, years, decades later, is arrested. 
Just days after Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob are arrested in 2017, she initially was cited as her brother-in-law Bernard La Roche's alibi, as we know. However, as we know from back then, the police quickly found her story was easily contradicted by witnesses, and once she was pressed, she changed up her story, stating that La Roche was the one that picked her up from school and then took Gregory. Another twist in this case is that in 2018, it would be eventually ruled that her experience while in police custody as a minor back then was unconstitutional. Whatever, you know, statements she may have had back then or whatever she may have done, you know, it's hard for them to, to uphold it years later considering the treatment that she faced while in police custody. And they aren't the only suspects. Those are the final names, but other relatives have also been temporarily linked and investigated by police but it led to no successful identification of the letter's author or the caller. These suspects included, at various points, parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, and cousins of Jean-Marie. Basically, you know, as Chia Verma says, you know, this whole family, there's something going on there, something a little fucked up going on if there are so many potential suspects within your own family. And so those are the major players. However, I still have more to share with all of you. Because you see, there have been some subsequent deaths that took place after Gregory's murder. We know, obviously, what happened when Jean-Marie shot and killed his own cousin, Bernard Laroche, on March 29th, 1985. As far as the case of Jean-Marie shooting his own and killing his own cousin, Jean-Marie sat in jail for a number of years, but he was technically not put on trial for the murder of Bernard Laroche until November 1993, after his wife's charges had been dropped. Jean-Marie, he pled guilty, but during trial said he also had no doubt that Bernard Laroche was guilty of having killed his son. Jean-Marie was sentenced to five years in prison, but considered four years already served from his previous time sitting in jail. There is one final death, a sad death, related to this case that took place in 2017. This pertains to the death of the judge who led and presided over the original case, the case that I believe Bernard Laroche was released on. The judge to oversee the original case, Jean-Michel Lambert, and a trigger warning for talk of suicide, Jean-Michel Lambert committed suicide after the case was reopened in 2017. Jean-Michel Lambert, that is, the judge, had actually been removed from the case in 1987 for his, and I quote, erratic handling having accused and imprisoned multiple separate family members. He had given an impromptu press conference after Bernard Laroche was first arrested, naming Muriel, providing some detailed information to the public before trial. Probably not the best thing to do as a judge. 14 documents of evidence in the case against Laroche ended up being removed due to procedural errors on Jean-Michel Lambert's part. Jean-Michel Lambert would write a letter to a local newspaper before his death, stating that the pressure of this case being reopened and his previous involvement being re-examined publicly was too much to bear. He also stated in the letter, a scapegoat will be sought to save face, and I refuse to play that role. Before we wrap up, we do have a bunch of other recent and current case updates. So officially, as of 2022, Gregory's murder remains unsolved. However, over the years, many arrests have been made, but no one has ever been convicted of this murder. After Judge Lambert was removed, he was replaced by another judge, Maurice Simon. Simon himself would eventually be removed from the case when he suffered a debilitating heart attack on January 30th, 1990, while being investigated for breaking confidentiality surrounding the case. However, before this judge's removal, Judge Maurice Simon, before his removal, he was able to reconstruct the possible crime scenes and possible driving routes or timelines that had been suggested over the years. This actually eventually helped lead to Christine Villemain's charges being dropped against her in 1993. In the year 2000, by the request of Jean-Marie and Christine Villemain, the case was reopened. They wanted to see if new DNA technology could help identify Le Corbeau, the crow, and possibly their child's killer or killers. They focused on trying to pull DNA from the stamp used on the final letter sent by Le Corbeau, but it was unsuccessful. Now, what is worth noting here, I just think what's curious is that Jean-Marie, earlier we noted that Jean-Marie was adamant that Bernard Laroche was the person who killed his son, and that's why he went and killed his cousin, La Roche. However, the fact that he wanted this case reopened probably means that 
he may not be actually 100% sure. Furthermore, the case was reopened twice over, uh, once again in 2008 and 2010 for further DNA testing. They were able to identify multiple different DNA samples, believing they were supplied by one man and one woman. I'm not saying necessarily these two, but again, this is probably why it leads to the conclusion that these two were potential suspects. They were not able to determine anything more specific than this other than comparing it against Christine and Jean-Marie who were not DNA matches. So at the very least, it seems that Jean-Marie and Christine were not involved in this murder. At least that's what the DNA seemed to say. Furthermore, in 2017, as we know, the case was reopened again. This was after heavy criticisms about the way the case was handled back in the 80s. As we know, three people were indicted Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob and, Mu and Muriel Boll, but ultimately these indictments were thrown out due to procedural errors once again. Finally, most recently the case was reopened in 2020. Authorities stated they believe they may have determined the identity of the person who made the threatening phone calls and wrote the confessional letter. They hoped to implement a new tool called Stylometrics to help identify whoever wrote the letter. Stylometrics is something that considers not just handwriting, but syntax, phrasing, and punctuation to help identify the author. A member of the police was quoted in Le Parisien, a newspaper in France, as saying, there will be new charges, that's for sure. And that was in 2020. And again, the case still to this day remains unsolved. All in all though, it is a tragic, horrific case, but it's also very fascinating from a true crime standpoint. There's yeah, so many different ways this case took shape, so many different suspects. And uh, <clears throat> I'd love to hear your thoughts. So let me know what you guys think in the chat as always. Parenthood Danny says, you have to wonder if it is the cousin, he's dead, so no further evidence can come forward. I think maybe that haunts Jean-Marie to, to an extent. You know, Jean-Marie killed Bernard Laroche, you know, thinking Laroche killed his son. And maybe Laroche did, but now, you know, we'll never know because Laroche can't speak on it. But you know, as terrible as this was, I'm just very grateful that you guys are all here with me. So thank you, as always, uh, to you in the Twitch chat and on YouTube for watching this. As I said before, I've got some uh, more true crime and true crime adjacent content, exciting content coming out on the YouTube channel soon. So if you haven't already subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure to click that subscribe button. Make sure to you know, hit the bell to turn your notifications on. If you're on Twitch, make sure to click on, turn on your notifications for these streams because we will continue having these more Red Monday streams every Monday and we're gonna dive into just more true crime cases. But either way, I appreciate you all for being here as always uh, to be with me as we dive into these cases, especially a heavy one like today.